It's great to be with you for the 10th Sunday after Pentecost. Um, August 6, we're going to be looking at all four of the readings today. The uh, Gospel reading is the very well-known story of the feeding of the 5,000. First of all, let's look at the first reading from Isaiah chapter 55. For several weeks now, the first reading has been coming from the prophet Isaiah. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy milk and wine without money and without price. I'm assuming that this passage was chosen because of the gospel account of the feeding of the 5,000. So often the uh, first reading does relate to the gospel reading. Um, in the LBW, the Green Hymnal from 1978, in the service of the word, the opening liturgy for the Lenten season quoted this passage here uh, from verse 1. Uh, so it's often used in a liturgical service for a Lenten season. And it's really an outstanding example of how so much of the liturgy is straight from the Bible. Verse 2, Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? I ask the question, what are some ways in which people today expend their time, energy, and resources on things that do not nurture, do not satisfy, do not endure? We squander resources for things that aren't worth what we spend on them. Verse 3, I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. We've talked many times about the biblical concept of a covenant. A covenant is in contrast to a contract. A contract is an agreement that is reached between two parties that are somewhat on an equal basis. Maybe it's a contract to buy or sell a home, a contract, an employment contract, where each side is, is in a position uh, to be able to negotiate. That's the concept of a contract. Well, in God's relationship with us, it's not a contract where <coughs> we are in a bargaining position. Instead, it is a covenant. A covenant is a gift. A covenant is a gift that is given by one party to another. And essential to the nature of a covenant is a promise and a commitment. And so God relates to us in terms of covenant, everlasting covenant. Like uh, Noah, you know, God has promised, I will never again send a flood to destroy the earth. And as a way to remind you of that, I will send a rainbow. I like the way that during the month of June, there were many posts on Facebook of a rainbow. And the emphasis was the rainbow, that's promise. That's not pride, trying to get back the original biblical meaning of rainbow as a sign of God's promise, not pride. Um, the covenant with Abraham, I will make of you a great nation and bless all the families of the earth through you. And I will give you a land, the covenant with David, Upon your throne, um, your descendant will sit forever, fulfilled in Jesus. Or the new covenant of Jeremiah, which is language that Jesus picked up in the institution of the Lord's Supper. Covenant, God makes a commitment, a promise. We can count on him, his steadfast, sure love. And then verse 5, God says to through the prophet to Israel, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you. It was never the intent that the blessings that God gave to Israel were to be kept by Israel just for Israel. Rather, they were to be shared with others. Kind of like um, in the Gospel reading where the little boy had the lunch and shared what he had with Jesus and look what Jesus was able to do with it. So also, we are to call nations that we don't know and nations that do not know us. We are to be the ones through whom all peoples of the world hear about Jesus. And this also is a common theme in the Old Testament, that Israel had this special blessing so that they would be a blessing. And we also have been blessed so that we will be a blessing. Uh, Genesis 12, 3, God said to Abraham, I will bless you and make your name great, and make you a great nation. And in you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. You are blessed so that you will be a blessing. Earlier in Isaiah, the prophet says, the God says, in days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established at the highest of the mountains, shall be raised above the hills, 
and all nations shall stream to it. That, that, that non-Jewish, non-Israelite people will be drawn and attracted to the faith, the God of the Israelite nation. Now it's interesting, I, I also put there Micah 4. Um, Micah and Isaiah were contemporaries. And it's interesting how the beginning of Isaiah 2 and the beginning of Micah 4 are almost word for word identical. And so you wonder who copied whom and who wrote first. Isaiah 42, I've given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations. Matthew 28, um, here, the emphasis is not, you know, you wait for the nations to come to you, but you, we, got, we as God's people got to go to them. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Or Acts 1.8, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Uh, the church that I was a uh, pastor of um, in Southern California, the zip code that the church was located in, was 70% non-Caucasian. And our school was mostly Latino and Asian, so we had the, the challenge as well as the opportunity to witness for Christ in an extremely multi, multicultural setting. And now that particular church has a pastor that was born in Mexico City and a couple Chinese pastors because it has become such a non-Caucasian area. And so, um, you know, we are to be a light to the nations. We are to share Christ with all peoples of the earth. Isaiah 55. Now, Psalm 145. I think this is also chosen because of the feeding of the 5,000. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. Verse 16, you open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. We're recording this on July 31, the last day of the month of July, and in Phoenix it has been brutally hot setting new records, 117, 118, 119. Where we live, the highest has been 116, which isn't quite so bad, but there was um, this seed that originally, they, they say that today, the last day of the month is gonna be the first day in Phoenix where the high is gonna be below 110. And where we live in Rio Verde, originally the high for today was predicted to be only 99, the first day all month that the high was below 100. But now they're predicting a high of 101. And I'm, when I got here at 10 o'clock, it was only 89. Wow, cool spell, cool. And, uh, but with all this heat, you think of what's happening to the wild animals. And on the news last night, they were talking about how tough this heat has been for the wild animals, the heat, and how do you get water? And, and, and you gotta have water when it's so hot. God providing for the animals, and there have been places that have been providing food and, and water and cooling for wild animals. Desperate need. Romans 9. <clears throat> now, the second reading for the last several weeks has taken place, um, has been from the Paul's Book of Romans, his great theological exposition. He culminates that at the end of Romans 8, which was last week's reading. Remember, if God is for us, who will be against us? All things work together for good. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us. Nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. Um, I mean, it is just a grand climactic ending to the theological portion of the book at the end of Romans 8, which was last week's second reading. Here now in Romans 9 through 11, Paul is wrestling with the issue of as a Jewish person, why do so many of my fellow Jewish people not believe in Jesus? This really agonizes him, and, and he's just struggling with that issue. That's going to be in Romans 9 to 11. And then verses 12 to 15, he's going to talk about the implications of the gospel and his teaching upon our Christian living. And then in Romans 16, he says hello to all of these people. Paul seemed to be one of those people that just knew so many people. But here you see in Romans 9, you see his heart. Um, Romans 1 through 8 has really, you see his head, his incredible intellect, the way that he was able to develop a, cell, uh, a theology of salvation by grace through faith and not because of works. 1 through 8, you see his brilliant theological mind. 9 through 11, you see his heart. He was one that had head and heart. And his heart is in pain because of all the 
Bible-believing Jewish people. Verses 1 through 3. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish. Not just sorrow, but great sorrow. And not just anguish, but unceasing anguish in my heart. I could wish that I myself were a curse and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people if my losing mouth salvation made it possible for the Jewish people to come to Christ, I'd be willing to have it go that way. Uh, you see that same heart for the people in Exodus 32, when after the golden calf incident, Moses intercedes from the people. This is intercession. You know, there are some people who, are, who see their role within the church as intercessors. There are people who just have a gift of being able to pray on behalf of other people in an incredibly intense way and see answers come to their prayers. But Moses praying for God's people, asking God to intercede for them, because at one point God says, you know, I won't destroy them, but um, you know, I'm not going to go with you on the rest of your wilderness wanderings. I will send my messenger, but I'm not going to go along. And Moses says, well, you know, if you're not going to go along, we're just going to stay here. We don't want to face the future without you. But here Moses says, you know, if, if you will only, but now if you will only forgive their sin, but if not, blot me out of the book that you have written. Moses as interceding for the people. And then in verses 4 to 5, um, Paul talks about the role that the nation of Israel has within the plan of God. They are Israelites. Even though they have rejected Christ, what he is hoping will happen is that the non-Jewish people coming to faith in Christ will make the Jewish people realize, hey, you know, maybe there's something that we're missing. And so he's hoping that the Gentiles coming to faith will motivate some Jewish people will come to faith. Because he's saying that the Israelites... Israel has always played a special role within the plan of God. Verses 4 to 5. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises, the patriarchs, and from them physically comes the Messiah. Jesus was a descendant from the Jewish people. This tells me that the physical descendants of Abraham, um, you know, because Paul talks about the the true Israel as those who have faith in the God of Abraham. but And so in that sense, the, uh, the church becomes Israel in the New Testament. But still, as I read it here, the Jewish people will always have a special place within the will of God, the physical descendants of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob. Now, let's go to the gospel reading, the story of the feeding of the 5,000. This is one miracle that is included in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It must have made such an impression upon them. It gives different details. I think Mark mentions that when the people sat down, they sat down on the green grass, which means it probably happened in the spring after the winter rains. Only John tells us where the food comes from, from the little boy. It gives, they give different details, but all four Gospels tell about where, about this particular incident. Now let's look at the site of this happening. Um, at the end of Matthew 13, Jesus is in his hometown of Nazareth, which is over here. And then we go up to here, which is Capernaum, which was the center of Jesus' ministry. And the traditional site of the uh, feeding of the 5,000 is at a place here called Tabga, which is a shortened version of a word that means seven springs. And this church here we're going to see a picture of is a church of the multiplication of the loaves and the fish. Uh, that's a little ways from the shore. At the shore itself at this place is another church that commemorates John 21. Jesus is appearing to the disciples after the resurrection and his saying to Simon Peter, do you love me more than these? And so on, the recalling of Peter. Uh, church for that appears at the sh is at the shoreline, but the church of the multiplication is a little bit inland. And so you can see how Tabga, the location of the feeding of the 5,000, isn't that far from 
Capernaum, the center of Jesus' ministry. So keep that in mind. Verses 13 to 14. Now, when Jesus heard this, um, what is this? Well, two possibilities, because the previous verses talk about the death of his cousin, John the Baptist. But another possible, it might be that when Jesus had heard that his cousin, John, had been beheaded. Another possibility is that um, Herod, the king, hears about Jesus' ministry and because of his bad conscience thinks, oh, this is John the Baptist risen from the dead. And so is heard this being John's death or Herod's interpretation of who Jesus is as John the Baptist risen from the dead. Well, whatever this is, Jesus heard this. This was a difficult time. Uh, Jesus just hears of the death of his cousin. He has to get away. If Jesus realizes the, the kind of the danger he is in because of what uh, Herod is thinking, he gets, needs to get away because he really doesn't confront um, the, 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 the people opposed to him until right at the end when he's ready for his crucifixion to happen. But Jesus hears this. Uh, we don't know exactly where Jesus is. It might be at Capernaum, which again is not too far from Tabga where the multiplication took place. But he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. He doesn't get away with the disciples. Often Jesus would get away with all 12 disciples, sometimes just with the inner three, Peter, James, and John. And sometimes he just got off by himself. And so think of when have been times in your life when you want to be with a, a, a group of friends, what have been some times in your life when you have wanted to be with your closest friends? And what are some times in your life when you wanted to simply be by yourself? Well, here Jesus wants to get off by himself. Well, the crowds see that he's going and they follow on foot. And we saw that Tabga really isn't that far for Capernaum. So it's believable that the crowds would have followed him from one place to the next. They follow him on foot from the towns. And when <coughs> Jesus comes ashore at Tabga, he sees the great crowd. And what's good, it's interesting, is he's not annoyed because his saying, I have to get away, has been interrupted. His, his efforts to be alone after the death of John the Baptist, his cousin, or the threatening comments from Herod, these efforts to be alone have been interrupted. But still, it doesn't say that he was annoyed. Instead, it says that he had compassion for them and cured their sick. How, gracious, how graciously Jesus handled interruptions. How graciously and how well do you handle interruptions? Verses 15 to 16. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place. The hour is late. Yeah, there's no food. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. Jesus was not going to let them off the hook that easily. When has Jesus not let you off the hook easily? Well, they replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. Um, only John tells how there happens to be five loaves and two fish, the boy whose mother had packed a lunch, kind of the super mom who makes sure that kid never leaves without a lunch. And so um, only in John do we have Simon Peter's brother Andrew coming to Jesus and saying there's a boy here uh, who has some food. But they just say that's all there is. That's, that's all that the people have. And he said, bring them here to me. Matthew doesn't tell us where the food comes from, only John does. But Simon Peter's brother telling Jesus we had five loaves and two fish says, but what are they among so many people? And, and I, that, that's just amazing. What are they? Well, actually, as it turns out, they are enough. In fact, they are more than enough. I make the comment in the study guide that I believe Jesus could have fed the 5,000 even without the little boy's lunch. But Jesus used what the boy had and gave, and of that little boy's little, 
made much. Taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up at the heaven, blessed and broke the loaves, gave it to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. See, in the hands of Jesus, little becomes enough. In fact, little becomes more than enough. And so the question for us is, what do you have in your hands? And what do you think Jesus could do with it if you were to take what you have in your hands and place it into his hands? I don't remember his name, but I remember the hearing twice a message from uh, somebody who had whose church had bought the forum in, in Inglewood. That is the place where the Lakers used to play. And there, there was a talk that he would give, and I heard it on two separate occasions. And he talked about how, you know, in my hands, a basketball means nothing. In, in uh, Michael Jordan's hands, you can see the timing of that, what a basketball could mean. In my hands, a football means nothing, and so-and-so, you know, uh, some great player's hands, a, uh, the, a, a, a football means this. And so in my hands, it might be just five loaves and two fish. But look what it can become if it is in Jesus' hands. What do you have in your hands? And what do you think Jesus could do with it if you were to take what is in your hands and place it into his hands? And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. What's amazing is that they had far more left over at the end than what they had when they first began. Twelve baskets, one basket for each disciple to remember the incident by. It may not seem much, but in the hands of Jesus, what I return to him is enough. In fact, it is more than enough. And so let us pray. Our Lord Jesus, we thank you for your provision of cooler temperatures, your provision of rain. We pray for the people who have suffered under the heat. We pray for the wildlife. We pray that you will provide sufficient water and cooler temperatures and food. We think of the example of Moses and of Paul in their interceding for the people. We pray that we will also be have that same kind of heart for those who do not know you. And Lord Jesus, we, we thank you for those times where, where we are able to get away, either with a group of friends, a small group, or even by ourselves. And when our lives are interrupted, we pray that we will remember how graciously you handled the interruption and that we will do the same. We will pray that we will have that same kind of compassion we think of the times where we try to get off the hook easily and you knew that we need to, to not be let off the hook. We thank you for the little boy who was willing to share his lunch. We thank you for what you were able to do, that it may not have seemed like much, but in your hands it was more than enough. So help us to be willing to place into your hands what you have put into our hands, knowing that in your hands what seem, might seem little is enough and more than enough. And in your name we pray. Amen.